you all for coming. Uh, this is my first time in New Zealand and uh, first time I got to get on to Tara. Uh, it's actually quite an emotional experience to come down here, see all the incredible work that's happening, and at that same time have an opportunity to share something with you. I was thinking of giving a talk and then I decided to rather than give a talk, uh, show you some things. So this is going to be, unlike David's smooth transitions, it's going to be all over the place. Which is a little team into my brain. Um, but I have to tell you with something, uh, although we're all proud of uh, who we all are and where we are as human society, uh, there are very big challenges ahead of us. And one of the things that I think about is this little picture out here. If uh, Can everybody hear me at the back? I was... Yes. I was yes. Okay. Uh, I was asking. Okay, uh, so one of the challenges that I face when I think about uh, our life, I mean, you know, if you read about sailing and going in deep blue, is that the same as actually going uh, in the deep blue? No, right? Uh, in science, one of the biggest challenges that we face right now, information is almost free. You can Google anything. You could Google plankton, you could Google a dinoflagellate and just learn all about it. It's not the same until it's peering back at you and you're actually collecting it from its environment and really trying to understand it deeply by connecting with it with scientific tools. And the big challenge is the fact that these scientific tools are not available to everybody. So today, I'm not going to tell you about any discoveries that I've made in my lab. Uh, we work on marine biology. I'll tell you about our mission of trying to bring these tools in hands of every single kid on this planet. It is the most important mission that I think uh, that I work on, and I want you to join in that journey, and I'll tell you in the very end how to join in. And uh, it's, I'm more excited about what you're going to discover, and I'm sure you guys have recognized this little animal. Anybody knows? Yeah. No? It's oh. a it's a <laughs> Tardigrade, yes, somebody said. It's a little water bear. Any moss that you find walking around, pick it up. Put it under a microscope and you're going to find a tiny little bear. It's going to have little claws crawling around. Uh, it's not going to have a little microscope in its hand though. Uh, um, so one of the challenges of how when I started thinking about this is I do a lot of work in developing countries and one of the challenges we face is the majority of schools in the world currently look like this. Maybe not your school, but majority of schools look like this, there is nothing. That's actually a picture that I took in Ghana. Uh, that's a hospital. A doctor once a while will actually arrive in that land. And one of the challenges is the fact that out of two billion kids on this planet, a billion kids live in poverty. That's the UN statistics. And around a billion people have absolutely no access to electricity, infrastructure, roads, nothing. And many of you are sailors, you go out there, you see the world, uh, and the challenge is how do you change that? How do you really bring science and creativity to everyone? And that's exactly the point of Plankton Planet from a context of citizen science. Uh, so let me jump to a single picture that really changed my view of the world. Anybody recognizes this gentleman? Uh, why? He, why is he not wearing any clothes? You see, he's very, very bare minimum clothes. Does anybody? So this is non-cooperation movement. In India, we were burning pants because they were taking our cotton, putting it there, and bringing us, selling clothes back. And, but he's using a British microscope. <laughs> he understood the power of being able to use tools to explore. I saw this picture, and that changed something in me, trying to think about science and society. Uh, at that time, uh, we designed a new way of thinking about microscopy, this we call Foldscope. Uh, you take a little piece of paper, you fold it together, and it turns into a functional microscope. It costs us around a dollar to make. Um, and we made this tool and we decided to share it. We built 50,000 of them and had a call, and anybody in the world who wanted one, we shipped them. And I'm proud to note, those little dots right there. These are you guys. It's actually extremely important. But what this did, it created a worldwide community of 50,000 people around the world exploring 
the biology at the smallest possible scale. This is actually a truly, it's a functional microscope. So uh, I was going to connect this and show you guys demos and images, but I'll do the next version of a tool very soon. But at the end of the talks, anybody can come and see. Uh, but you notice a very important thing. What's missing? Of course, we need to paint the world uniformly, but the oceans are missing. That's exactly where I got a, one day a call from Columban and I was jumping up and down to have an opportunity for all of us to actually explore the rest of the planet. And this led to an entire self-assembled community of people around the world teaching each other, building. And I'm going to show just a quick video and then I want to switch to demos. Uh, so while this plays on, I'm going to set up some of my demos. So that's Northeast India. This is actually a fairly remote part of India. Those were army rangers trying to protect the rhinos. You build the instrument, and one of the contexts that comes out of it, you immediately get to use it. So if I had a cell phone connected to this, this is what you would see. That's a live sand fly, and it actually carries Lushman Isis. It's the first You're seeing live blood flowing. This is a developing ant. You're watching the brain of this ant grow. That's a single cell. There you just watch the diatom walking around. That's a group in Madagascar. Now these kids don't, can't afford shoes or shirts, but they have 80% of the species there are not found anywhere else. So they are the keepers of these species. important one. This is actually a Syrian refugee camp. Tons of these people have been displaced from their homes. This is in Lebanon and they are trying to move their mind away from this war-torn place to really actually be creative and thinking about science. my favorite part of this video. So, one of the aspects of this... If you want to bring science to people, you really have to show them in the way that just us science, why are we all obsessed, is because we observe it. So I'm going to actually show you some things. How many minutes do I have? Wow, I have four minutes. This is never happened. Okay, yes. Uh, so now one of the context is, uh, I'm going to pass one of these instruments around. And first of all, I want you to experience what you would experience if you don't have scientific eyes. So every row is going to get a little soup of the uh, drop of the ocean. And you can take a look at it, pass it around. Uh, but, so you can pass it to the left, and what do you see? This, what do you actually see? A whole bunch of water with some dirt in it. <laughs> and this is the experience that you would have if you don't have these scientific eyes. And one of the things that ends up happening is you take a little drop of it, you put it in, this is one of the microscopes right here, I turn it on, and now I am actually in a completely different world. I've zoomed in, I zoomed in with this instrument 150 times and magnified these little things that are you passing around. And I'm seeing pictures, not exactly at this magnification, but at a magnification that I can actually appreciate. And I'm going to plug this in to be able to show you what you might see if you peer through one of these microscopes. And uh, this is a new instrument. So one of the ideas is that all the plankton knots that are who are out there will not just be able to share samples with us, but be able to experience these uh, little microscopic things 
by themselves to really understand how life at the very smallest scale behaves and moves and heats each other up, <laughs> which is very exciting. Uh, so one of the things is, uh, this is one instrument that I'm going to pass around to people. People should take a look at it, uh, pass it to the next person, but don't pass it until you actually see something. It's very important. So, and since these front row people have had a week with me playing with these instruments, they don't get the chance. Uh, oh, maybe from that side. Let's do that. <laughs> And what you're looking at is just a sample, and I'm moving it around right here. And then once you've seen it, you pass it to another person. Uh, but you'll all actually be able to see something right here. So I took that same slide. And let me actually move away from the polarization. And what you're seeing right here is that same little soup. But now notice the infinite little forms of life. Right there, I don't know if some of you can identify that object right there, the little, little circles. So start thinking about this, that in that little drop of muddy water, which you just have passed around, there are infinite number of life forms, all right in front of you all available for you to explore. There's a little animal right there you see up there. A little copepod up there with its little eye. And now I'm going to actually switch as Emmanuel talked about a little bit. I'm now illuminating it in a different way and stars light up. That's polarization. And you're seeing all kinds of crystalline material that is available to these life forms. And sand grains, you see like starry nights, and I'm going back again. Uh, and I could keep exploring for the entire day and night. And you start realizing both how wonderful this little soup that you couldn't appreciate otherwise actually is. And at that same time, as scientists, how incredibly difficult this is to understand. In this little soup right here could be 10 to 100,000 species. We're talking about in this tiny little drop. You go out in the ocean and you start understanding how they interact with each other, how they talk to each other. And this is exactly why we need you. We need everybody to engage in this because we as scientists are just too small, too little a group to be able to comprehend this vast ocean. So what my appeal to you would be is to go think about this and don't think of your role as just supporting science. You're actually an incredibly important piece in this to be able to do this kind of science at a global scale. We actually need you as participants, not just as somebody who would watch the action from a distance. Thank you. Yes.